Welcome to this episode of Disease Du Jour. We're going to take time to review topics of interest from the 2020 AAP Virtual Convention with the Technical Services Veterinarian Team at Merck Animal Health. Merck Animal Health is the 2020 sponsor of this podcast, and we are pleased to announce that Merck is going to be joining us again in 2021 as the sponsor of the Disease Du Jour podcast. So make sure and tell them thanks when you see them next time. Before we begin, remember that anyone who signed up for the AEP Virtual Convention can go in and watch the on-demand presentations until the end of June of 2021. So if you didn't get a chance to attend one of the presentations we're going to talk about today, you can still go back and attend. And to give you reviews of the sessions, topics, and presenters that you might have missed, our guests for today's Disease to Shore podcast are Dr. Fairfield Bain, Dr. Earl Gaughan, Dr. Bryant Craig, Dr. Dwayne Chapel, Dr. Chrissy Schneider, and Dr. Craig Barnett, and they'll be appearing in that order. Since many veterinarians who attend the live conventions love the hallway chats they have, we wanted to bring you kind of a taste of that in this episode. So we're going to hear from each of these veterinarians about topics and presentations that they enjoyed at this convention, so you can go back and listen to them. So we're going to start with Dr. Bain. And Dr. Bain, could you tell us a little bit about some of your favorite uh, presentations you watched and um, maybe a, a few takeaways from them? I will. You know, uh, one, thanks for having us. And I'm going to echo what I said in our last time to talk. I missed being able to be there with everybody. Um, I did find it a little challenging sometimes because when you're at home doing work, it's different than when you're away at a meeting and you can focus on the meeting a little bit. And I'm sure a lot of people probably had that, but I enjoyed the mix of the real time sessions and then being able to go back kind of on my own schedule and, and look at some talks. So I did pick out a few. Um, Dr. Chris Navis at Pennsylvania did a presentation on using the flash uh, ultrasound technique for evaluating colics. And I'm a huge proponent of using ultrasound as a tool in evaluation of the colic patient. And I think the flash has grown in popularity in the last couple of years because it it's aimed at helping you spot real important key findings without having to spend time going over the whole abdomen. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a proponent of learning the abdominal anatomy with ultrasound. I think once people do that, they will get a lot more comfortable and they'll start to explore beyond the, the specific points of interest. But that gets you started. That's sort of, I view it as the starting point of knowing what to look for. And he had, as usual of Dr. Navis, had great images. He has a great outline of how you can appro approach the colic exam. In a, in a systematic order, like a lot of things you might do. So I really liked how he did that. And I think um, that would be a good tool for people to review because it'll help you get familiar with the, what things should look like as you work your way through a colic. And I think it you'd come away with some confidence that, that you could do that. And then in the colic uh, theme, Dr. Hassel at Colorado State did one on how to safely and effectively perform a rectal palpation. And I think we all recognize the challenges of the maintaining the art of practice and the challenges of education uh, for equine practitioners um, in, in focusing back on the art of the physical exam. And, and this, to me, is the bread and butter of, of practice and I hope people save this presentation because it was great. I mean, not only for a new graduate, but for somebody who's been doing it almost 40 years. I think when you listen to somebody with Dr. Hassel's experience and, and listen to how she thinks it through, uh, she did a great job. She has great images of where things are, what you should feel, a um, little bit of tweaks about the rectal exam. And so I'd encourage everybody to, to go watch that presentation um, and especially for new graduates that maybe lack a little confidence ha hadn't gotten a lot of opportunity to do it while you're in school go go review this thing maybe review it regularly i would say i, I was that big it was one of my favorite uh, 
presentations. Um, and then um, one that I think is kind of pertinent to what we've kind of experienced all year is it may go under the wire, but anybody that's thinking about building a new facility or altering your current hospital facility that talked by Dr. Pantaleon and Heather Lewis, an architect, the review of equine hospital design techniques for controlling uh, infectious disease. They did a really nice job of talking about, you know, what should be common sense, but thinking about flow and in a hospital and where things should be and how you think about it. And one of the things, interestingly, the architect herself emphasizes hand washing and, and having things located. So it makes it easy to do that kind of stuff. And I thought it was a really well thought out presentation. Um, not everybody's likely to be planning that, but you may advise your clients even on how they're going to create a facility. And I think there's some pretty good nuggets in that talk. And then I kind of jumped onto the full focus. A um, couple friends of mine, Dr. Ramiro Toribio at Ohio State, um, he and I go back a ways, and he did a presentation on hormonal changes in sick foals. And then Admittedly, this is a bit about the, the hospitalized foal, but how, example, the adrenal system responds to infection and sepsis. Um, he outlined a, a great pathway so you understand uh, when things go south. They're underlying a lot of what you see, um, you know, foal's response to infectious situations uh, involve hormonal control. And then my brother from another Dr. Nathan Slovis at Haggard's did a good job kind of giving you an overview of foal diarrheas. Um, it's hard to get, you know, really enthusiastic about diarrheas, but Nathan's entertaining. He even had a story about they have dogs that can sniff out Clostridium difficile, and he, he was thinking that was even better than a technician because you don't have to pay their health insurance. Um, so he can be funny on occasion. Uh, but it was a good overview of the different agents, a little bit of the thought processes of how you're going to control things. Uh, let me kind of kick along here. We got into the rotococcus topic. Uh, Dr. Uh, Susie Kahn, who's a Ph.D. student with Noah Cohen at Texas A&M, did one on anti-PNAG titers that correlate with protection against rotococcus foal pneumonia. And for those who are not informed about PNAG, I want you to really, you know, memorize this word, polyacetylglucosamine, or PNAG, or PNAG, you may hear people say. So you'll probably hear more about that uh, in the coming years. And um, they did a study, but she outlined some prior studies that were important that get you to that point. So they had done studies vaccinating mares with PNAG and showed that it protected their foals from rotococcus pneumonia. They've also done a study where they transfused them with anti-PNAG hyperimmune plasma, and that showed some protection. And then in vitro studies, they've shown that the PNAG antibody was superior to standard or hyperimmune rotococcus plasma at um, mediating phagocytic killing of rotococcus. So there's some background to it, but basically they looked at a couple farms and they transfused them with hyperimmune plasma and um, and the anti-PNAG uh, plasma and showed significant differences. She spends time talking, not to give away her talk, but I, I was very interested in this. She, she talks about the different levels of immune evaluation and how that flows. And so I, I think you'll see more about PNAG or PNAG here in the next uh, few years. Um, and one other one that's very close to that was Dr. Alshweed at Root and Riddle. She presented on whether transfusing two liters of hyperimmune plasma is superior to one liter. And indeed it is. And she does a nice job going back in the history, reviewing things all the way back to Dr. Martins in 1989 at Texas A&M starting that, that process that's so common in practice nowadays and talking about the dose and volume. So it turns out there's some nuggets in this thing. Um, two liters is, is indeed better than one liter. I mean, the odds of pneumonia with only one liter were two and a half times greater. And uh, the other nugget is she talks about what people kind of know is that foals born earlier have a lot less, like January to March, have a lot less 
risk of getting rotococcus than those that are born April through May. Um, and then one last thing that I kind of liked because I, I like hematology, Dr. Ashley Whitehead at the University of Calgary did a talk on how to perform whole blood transfusions in the horse. And um, she goes through a really nice uh, presentation of thoughts about picking your donor, the important points. Um, and in past, we would have said, oh, sure, we want a Coggins, at least in the EVA. But she added now that we can even screen them for parvovirus, which when you give plasma, plasma-based products, we, we've kind of known over the years that Tyler's disease or liver failure are, is a risk. And so that same thing goes with blood transfusion, since she talked about that. And I mean, the, the essential take home is, well, pick your horse and then, you know, you can collect about eight, eight liters from a, a typical adult horse. Uh, but that's a worthy, worthy talk. So that was kind of the ones that I picked for ones I enjoyed. And it's hard to have the excuse that I got hung up in the hallway talking to somebody and I couldn't make it to the other talk, you know, since I was sitting at home. But but those are the ones I liked. So. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bain. And I'll, I will make sure and put all of these uh, topics on the article page on equimanagement.com. So if you miss what the, the name of the article was or something, that it will make it easier for you to find them. You can go search them by topic or by presenter. So we'll make sure and do that on the article. So next, let's go to Dr. Gone. So what were some of your favorite takeaways from the, the presentations that you went? Well, first of all, I probably need to start by saying that once again, Dr. Bain has made me look like an underachiever and um, I was not able to attend as many presentations as he was. And, uh, you know, I, I think since we're talking about a recap of the whole thing, I, I'm i not that much older than Dr. Bain, but I am technologically challenged. I find the vir virtual format a little more frustrating. Um, I suspect quite a few of my colleagues feel the same way, but um, that said, you know, to be able to get the information this way remotely and virtually is valuable. Um, but I had a couple of talks that kind of rose up to the top for me and Dr. Amy Grice talked about why veterinarians leave practice and um, to me, that's an area of interest because of my former academic career and I've always enjoyed my teaching background, and we have played a substantial role from Merck Animal Health in looking at some of these um, explanations for what's not really positive and on the mental health and the uh, well-being aspect of veterinarians today. And what Dr. Grice presented was not necessarily a lot of new things, but it's uh, data that was reinforcing what we probably already know. Um, things that cause people to consider or to actually leave practice include uh, the current student debt issues that are facing uh, our younger generation, if you will, the hours that are worked, um, the disruption of what has become known as work-life balance, essentially, and because of the tremendous um, gender shift to women veterinarians in equine practice, you know, certainly the family issues, which I would argue men experience as well, but obviously we don't experience the childbearing burdens as well as the pressures that come along with that. And so she does a very nice job of, of exploring the data that was extrapolated from a survey study, bringing these issues to the front and bringing some very pertinent and poignant um, quotes from um, female veterinarians as to why they either have considered or have indeed left. Um, the one thing that I found interesting here, comparing back to the uh, veterinarian well-being study that Merck has participated in with the AVMA, and and it's a when I present that data out from our Merck study, um, we compare the long hours that are worked by equine veterinarians. And that was brought out in this presentation by Dr. Grice on the Merck study. It was interesting how not working enough hours when you look at veterinarians across all practice types is actually a greater stressor and influence on well-being and mental health 
than um, than working too many hours. And I think that probably directly relates back to the financial questions. So um, my personal takeaway is we still have a tremendous dilemma and equine um, veterinary medicine is facing it probably more profoundly than anybody else because when we look at graduates from vet school, we're down in that less than 2% pursue equine practice, probably less than 1% actually stay in it. Um, we have an aging population of equine veterinarians. And so what are we going to do in another decade? Um, and another personal challenge that I feel like we all have to participate in is this cost of education that has gone so essentially out of control when compared back to what people's earning potentials are as veterinarians. I, we have not successfully dealt with that yet, and I think we need to take these issues. They've been identified. Now we just have to take them on and figure out what we're going to do. So I, I appreciated Dr. Grice's work and the way she presented it. I uh, would encourage everyone who has an interest in that to at least read the review or the paper that she has published in the proceedings as well as listen to the presentation. The other one, because I, again, probably explaining my trouble with some of these virtual things is I'm a surgeon by training, so my attention span is short. Um, and, and so I, I appreciated looking at some of the updates on the biological therapies that were um, presented in the biological therapies talk. Um, this was a case-based presentation with some audience feedback attempts, which is always nice to have when you're doing these to get some live feedback, but the presenters did a nice job going through what options are out there from the biological perspective from platelet-rich plasma and stem cells, which have probably been around longer, to the IRAP considerations, the newer generations of ProStride and some of the other newer products that are out there. They went through some case specifics where these agents were used successfully, but what I always appreciate is they, they concluded with some cases that did not go well. And I think that's probably one of the reasons we all tune into some of these, go, what, what can I do better from that last case that didn't go well? And they had some nice insights there and some encouragements. I think it's, it's an it's a interesting and evolving rapidly kind of a field um, as we see new entries into the biologic manipulations of horses' own tissues to help them heal. Um, but as been said about many things, um, not one thing cures everything. So I think to be selective and draw on each other's case experiences becomes important. So um, I'll stop there and just encourage people to pursue those two and um, um, look forward to hearing what the others have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaughan. Those sound very interesting. And now we're going to chat with Dr. Bryant Craig, can you tell me what some of your favorite takeaways were and some of the presentations? You bet, Kim. <clears throat> I've got several that I'll give you kind of a, a brief overview on and, and things that I found interesting when um, going through those talks. And just as kind of everybody else has said, the uh, <clears throat> virtual environment allowed me to kind of go back and, and pick and choose a lot easier than maybe I would have been able to at the actual convention. So. So that was something maybe I appreciated that uh, I haven't been able to do in the past. Um, and the first one of those was the Kester News Hour. It's always been one of my favorite sessions. Uh, as Dr. Gaughan said, some of us don't have a real long attention span and I, I'm included in that group. And so the uh, fast pace of the Kester News Hour has always <clears throat> been one of my favorites. But I, I got to go back and and stop and and listen again to some of the topics and, and that was helpful and there's there's things in there from people that are working with angry brood mares to to those injecting joints so uh, i think any everybody can can glean a little something from this year's kester news hour um <clears throat> the other one that that wasn't on my initial list was a overview of racehorse medications and this was just i thought a great kind of state of the state on what's going on in that industry when it comes to medications and <clears throat> regulations and how we're monitoring and, and justifying use of 
any and all medications in the racehorse industry. So anybody maybe involved or on the fringes of that aspect of of the horse industry um, should give that one a listen. And then into the the topics that I kind of had highlighted going into the meeting. Um, the first was feeding the overweight performance horse uh, by Dr. Shepard. And again, just a lot of really practical, um, logical thought processes for that group of horses um, from <clears throat> maximizing forage use in their ration, paying attention to that hay quality, uh, utilization of a balancer pellet in a, in a lot of those horses was something that um, I thought was of interest to to many people and then different techniques to slow consumption of that ration for that group of horses as well um, from hay nets to grazing muzzles and different strategies um, <clears throat> that can help us with that overweight horse moving on uh, the next one was interleukin 6 biomarker in placentitis by dr fedorka um, this one was a particular interest to me and in having managed lots and lots of brood mares in practice and, and always kind of scratching my head in that last trimester when you're going through those placental evaluations and, and trying to figure out which mare to treat and which one to just kind of keep your fingers crossed. And uh, this work showed a lot of promise. Uh, the IL-6 as a biomarker proved to be 97% sensitive and 75% specific. So um, shows a, a large degree of promise to us and something that we can use in addition to our clinical exam. I'm um, going to need a, a little additional work, but um, she did find that that biomarker was elevated in allantoic, amniotic, and maternal serum. So um, lots of different tissues could be measured. Um, the only thing that was a little disappointing, it didn't work in the acute phase. So um, if we if we caught a mare in the acute phase of placentitis, it, it may not be as telling, but um, I do look for, for more work on that in the future and get excited to see what it brings us. And kind of staying on that same page of, of biomarkers, uh, the next one was MRNA biomarkers and catastrophic injuries of racehorses by Dr. Page. And again, uh, this one had a good pretty good sensitivity of 76 percent, a specificity, specificity of 88 percent. Um, so shows a lot of promise in that field and I think it'll really help in that in that pre-race screening period that three to five days leading up to a race large groups of horses could be easily screened whereas some of the the pet scans and things like that <clears throat> it's harder to get a, a very large group of horses done in that time period. So um, maybe a way to, to screen the large group and kind of cone down on horses that need a little more focus on them. So um, I'm sure we'll see more work done on that in the future as well. And then lastly, the assisted repro table topic uh, by Dr. Hendricks and Hatzel. And as most table topics go, lots and lots of practical information here. Um, I was a little worried about the table topics with the virtual format, but man, this one was full of great questions, lots of interaction. Um, we got a lot of good information on not only techniques, uh, difficult cases, but just some of those things that you only learn when you're doing these things like, you know, different pieces of equipment people are using, how they're maintaining them, how they're cleaning them, and in the application of a, a lot of different tools and techniques. So uh, anybody doing any reproductive work, even if you're not doing ICSI or oocyte aspiration, um, there's a lot to learn by listening to this table topic. And that kind of wraps up um, the, the top talks that I listened to, um, but I still look forward to going back and, and reviewing a lot of them that I haven't quite had the time to, to listen in on. Today's Disease to Shore podcast is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the makers of prestige vaccines, Banamine, Panicure, Regimate, Protozil, and other trusted equine health solutions. 
Merck Animal Health works for you and for horses. Learn more about Merck Animal Health's comprehensive portfolio of products, as well as their ongoing investment in our industry, profession, and community at MerckAnimalHealthUSA.com. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Craig. Some of those I haven't gotten to listen to yet, so I'm going to make sure and put them on my list to go back in and see. And next, we're going to hear from Dr. Dwayne Chappell. So what were some of your topics that you enjoyed the most and some takeaways? Well, Kim, as others have mentioned, um, it's a real challenging environment to go virtual from what had been a very relationship-oriented convention in the past. And so... As, as others have stated, and I would continue to echo and support, uh, moving forward, I hope we can get back to the, the old way of doing convention. I, we, we sure miss catching up in the hallway with individuals and, and connecting in ways that uh, virtually just didn't lend itself too well this year, I didn't think. But I do think uh, from what Dr. Craig just mentioned, the table topic scenario seemed to work out really well. I was able to attend several, but I'd like to highlight uh, the managing the mare with abnormal estrus cycle that Dr. Jen Linton and Dr. Pat McHugh did so well. Um, they came in with some um, information that they wanted to make sure and share throughout that table topic and then were able to also blend in questions from the, the attendees along the way. I think it's a very timely topic for anybody that's doing some repro work as we start into the first of the year. and and those abnormal ester cycles are always the kind of the burr in our saddle to try to work through and and get that mare to ovulate in a timely way and and get it to connect well with that shipment of semen that may be coming so that's a good one that i think it has some standing going into the spring it's one that uh, if you hit a little bump in the road it may be one to go back and review and get a another idea or two that maybe has fell off of your typical uh treatment scenario. So touch on that one. Uh, then the uh, pre-purchase exams, and it was titled uh, pre-purchase exams, ethical dilemmas and best practices. Uh, Dr. Kent Morgan moderated that as the chair for the professional conducts and ethics committee and, and had three veterinarians as well as an attorney that was their panel that he bounced several questions off of. And, you know, that's one of those um, uh, type talks in the past that kind of gets uh, moved to a, a time period where people either got to come really early in the morning if they want to attend it, or it's always in conflict with something else. So there again, virtual convention lended this in a way that a lot of people could attend that may want to. And the attendee list was high. It was close to 200. So it was a well-attended event. They really uh, address some of the real challenges with the pre-purchase environment, and and I think it was uh, accepted real well. It would be definitely one I'd like to see highlighted that maybe could be used in the future for student chapter meetings and opportunity to kind of get young veterinarians uh, some ideas of how to work through some of the challenges that seem to be more common in the young practitioner while they're trying to establish their boundaries and guidelines of, of how they want to do practice. Uh, moving to the Milne lecture and Dr. John Hubble's uh, wonderful look back at the generations that we went through in the field of anesthesia and doing it in such a way that uh, I think was a nice historical to present day perspective. And Dr. Hubble has been uh, just to stand out in the field, but by the same token has been so uh, uh, humble to pass on uh, opportunities and and noteworthiness to others often before himself. But I was glad to see that he got spotlighted at, at this and got to share some of his life learnings with us. Uh, right prior to the Milne lecture was the closing session, and for some of you that maybe have routinely attended the president's luncheon in the past, this was kind of to fill that slot and give some recognition to the award winners of different areas within the AEP that each year uh, are recognized. My understanding those award winners will get um, re-recognized, if you will, or receive their actual awards at the Nashville convention 
in a year from now. And then it also brought forth our new officers for AEP as well as our new board members. So uh, a good closing session to complement what they had as a good opening session. Uh, but as others have said, I'm, I'm ready for this to be face to face and in person in 2021. Thanks so much, Kim. Well, you're welcome. And thank you so much, Dr. Chapel. I mean, we, we all miss being there live and in person, but I, I think the AAP under the circumstances had a really great alternative so that at least we could get together. And, and I agree with you that the table topics, the ones that I attended, they had large audiences and lots of, of chatting from the audience. So lots of good questions. So I think that was, um, those worked really well. So I've got to agree with you there. And as far as the award recognitions and the new officers and board members and so forth, on equimanagement.com under the news section, we are in the process of posting all of those press releases from AAP. So you can go into Equimanagement and read a little bit about each one of those people, read those award winners. Um, and if you're the, the quickie kind of person, you can go see it on Facebook. So we've got to post on Facebook as we're getting those up. So thank you very much, Dr. Chapel. Next, we're going to go to Dr. Christy Schneider. So what, uh, what were the topics that you, I know you attended quite a few, but what were your takeaways on some of the favorites? Hi, Kim. Hi, everybody. Thanks for this opportunity. I'm going to try um, to, to pare down um, my comments. I don't want to keep everyone here all day, but there were a lot of really great sessions um, that I was able to attend and, and still some more that I want to go back, um, and listen to for sure. And, and one that I don't think I mentioned, um, in our preview conversation, uh, is that turned out to be great. Uh, that I highly recommend everyone, um, anyone who's doing neck rads in the field, um, you know, have a listen and, and watch this session. It's pre-purchase exams, improving cervical spine imaging in the field. And it was a table topic moderated by uh, Dr. Natasha Werpe and Dr. Kurt Selberg. And they had fantastic images, really great images, um, and talked about taking both lateral uh, neck rads and also oblique views and talked a lot about positioning and showed really great examples of well-positioned um, and well-exposed neck rads versus uh, less than perfect positioned radiographs, which I think anyone who's ever tried to take neck rads has plenty of those. Um, at least I know I do. And when you see the well-positioned, well-exposed images next to, um, you know, the, the less uh, perfect ones, you're, you can see so much more. And, and they did a great job going through anatomy. Um, so highly recommend that one. And then... Um, Another table topic, infectious diseases at large competitions, that one moderated by Dr. Pasterla uh, and Dr. Ashley Whitehead. And they did a really great job, um, you know, talking about a, a really complicated topic, um, you know, biosecurity and infectious diseases and how do we keep um, sick horses out of competitions, you know, which is hard to do sometimes. Um, and Dr. Whitehead did a great job of reminding the audience of resources available, um, both on the AAEP website. So they have, um, handouts regarding biosecurity and also a flow chart for guidance for handling disease outbreaks. So if you're somebody that is in the position, you know, you're going to be asked questions about this, um, you know, it's great to kind of have a step-by-step, -step, um, something you can go back and, and look at. And then another great resource that I, I didn't know about um, that's free, which is always great, is a biosecurity toolkit for equine events. And that's available, you can just Google it, um, through the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And it looks like it would be a really great, uh, valuable resource for, for vets that, you know, have the responsibility of, of monitoring or maintaining biosecurity in these equine events. And then, you know, I, I'm into eyes. I like equine ophthalmology. It's very interesting to me. Um, always has been, really. And the table topic um, regarding ophthalmology led by Dr. Leslie Easterwood and Dr. Carol Clark was really fantastic. They talked about, you know, just as everyone has said, there's been great interaction and great um, questions asked in these table topics. So you kind of bounce around and cover all kinds of, of different stuff. Um, so they talked about a lot of topics, but some of the takeaways 
uh, new things that I am not as um, familiar with, I guess, uh, but seems like great tools are corneal cross-linking for treatment of melting corneal ulcers. That's a new technique to me. Um, basically, sounds like you apply topical drops uh, that are riboflavin drops, and then you apply a light of a specific um, wavelength, um, 365 nanometers, uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> for a prescribed period of time. Um, and it, it basically just makes the cornea stronger, um, which is amazing. They also talked about the, the utility of using ultrasound for evaluating, uh, the retina and also the pupil size. And I, you know, I think most of us have learned about using ultrasound to evaluate the retina, especially if you can't see through a cloudy cornea, but using it to assess pupil size, which just was just something I hadn't thought about. And that would be really helpful if you can't see through the cornea. And then they also talked about photodynamic therapy or PDT for squamous cell carcinoma cases, uh, specifically of the eyelid. And Dr. Easterwood had some amazing pictures of uh, before and after for, with these really big squamous cell carcinomas that, you know, before, um, you know, without PDT, you would have to enucleate um, and exonerate, really just take a lot of tissue. Um, and it looks like a really useful um, way to save, save the eye in situations where we couldn't have before. And then, um, one session that Dr. Bain actually, um, I guess highlighted for our preview or in our preview podcast, uh, that I really hadn't thought about attending until he made the recommendation. So thank you, Dr. Bain, uh, was the CT assessment of brain damage by various fire firearms to determine euthanasia efficacy of horses. And that was a presentation, an on-demand presentation given by Dr. Jane Lund. And uh, she basically used cadaver heads um, and then various firearms and bullet types and evaluated um, after um, the gunshot basically to these cadaver heads, evaluated with CT um, and scored the damage inflicted by the various firearms and bullet types. And, you know, I think a lot of veterinarians, depending on maybe where you grew up or how, how comfortable you are with firearms in general, um, you know, maybe you hadn't considered firearms as a euthanasia option, but it's, I think, a, a valid and, and valuable option, um, especially when we talk about, you know, environmental impacts of euthanasia solution, you know, disposal of um, of remains and things like that. So that's something that I would recommend everyone check out. And then really one of my favorite, um, table topics that I watched was about mentoring new grads and introducing them to, to a practice. And that was moderated by Dr. Luke Bass and Dr. Kim Harmon. And really a, a really interactive table topic, lots of audience participation. Um, Dr. Bass and Dr. Harmon had a lot prepared as well. Um, so just really great nuggets. Um, they talked a lot about uh, feedback and how important it is um, and ways to do it well um, and ways to learn how to do it well. Also talked a little bit about how to handle conversations with new grads or, or younger veterinarians who may have a hard time hearing feedback, which um, is always tricky. And then um, one of the, this was from an audience member, Dr. Sellen uh, was just given, you know, opportunity to talk a little bit. And she, I think, said something that hit everybody watching. Um, I don't know why I say hard, but just really uh, is an important nugget, I think, that uh, kind of changed the the tone of of the session a little bit. And she said that, you know, she thinks it's important to mentor new grads so that they can accomplish their goals rather than mentoring them to practice like you. And I, I think hearing that, um, I, I think that was a profound thought that I think um, anyone who mentors anyone, um, you know, could file that one away. And then uh, also they talked about the importance of sharing as a mentor, sharing your, in quotes, epic failures with your mentees, um, because a lot of times these younger practitioners think they need to be perfect and never make a mistake. And, you know, if they haven't witnessed to their mentors 
failures, they may think, of course, they've never had any failures and made any mistakes, which of course we all know is not true. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll call it there, but there is so much um, great information um, available. Like I said, I'm still going to go back and, and watch some more sessions. Um, I, of course, missed seeing everybody, um, just as everyone else in this group mentioned. I did see on some um, Facebook pages and the um, the AEP uh, email listserv that there were quite a few people that really enjoyed the virtual format and were able to attend when they normally can't attend AEP. So it'll be interesting to see in the future, um, you know, if if having some sort of hybrid or the ability of some, um, you know, virtual involvement for people could extend maybe AEP's reach and, and the ability for some people to participate who can't come in person for a variety of reasons. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Schneider. And yeah, I've, I've talked to some of the folks at AAP, and of course, they've got uh, Karen Pouts there now as their online education person who basically has a master in online education. So she has been a, a great asset to them in trying to get these things done and make them as painless as possible. Because as, as we've said, it's not everyone's favorite thing because we love being there and hugging people and talking to people. So it, that's a hard thing to change. So... Okay, now we're going to uh, talk to Dr. Barnett. Dr. Craig Barnett, could you maybe give us some takeaways from your favorite presentation? Sure. If, if uh, Dr. Gaughan thought he was an underachiever, I'm going to I'm gonna go one step more than him and as, as the maximum underachiever here, based on what everybody else's input's been. But anyway, some really good thoughts from everybody else. And um, quick, just quickly, on to, to continue the, the, the discussion about the virtual meeting uh, I think it's. I think. I think the hybrid approach might be something to to give strong consideration to. I do. Uh, I did kind of. I do kind of like the fact that I can go back and and see presentations. And and I'm kind of a slow learner, or some would say a very slow learner. So to be able to see and watch these presentations multiple times or go through them slowly is is, is very helpful to me. So the the, the one I'll kind of comment on a little bit was actually a virtual showcase uh, through the Merck booth. Uh, Practical Tips for the Diagnosis and Prevention of, of EPM by Dr. Nicola Pasterla. And I, this was a phenomenal presentation. I wish it could have been in the general session where it might have gotten a little more, uh, some more viewing. Uh, but where I'm gonna, I would still encourage everybody to, to go listen to this presentation. It was really good. Dr. Pasterla has, a, I think, a great way of, of blending research and clinical, uh, practical things together. And he did a great job in this presentation of doing just that. He kind of went through and started the presentation, just kind of reviewing some of the things that that we whoops, I'm sorry, my doorbell reviewing some of the things that we have all experienced before that we all kind of familiar with as far as the serial prevalence of um, EPM, you know, being pretty high and not relying on just a serum sample. Um, he highlighted again what we all have kind of been become familiar with the hallmark of EPM being you know, the progressive, asymmetrical, uh, multifocal clinical presentation. He gave three uh, case uh, presentations that were really good, just showing some different case presentations where you might be thinking of EPM, but then when they worked them up and went through all the diagnostics, the physical exam, the neurological exam, and the immunodiagnostics and all that, and then, then came to a final diagnosis on those three cases and one ended up being uh, cervical vertebral malformation. One, one was West Nile and the other was EPM. But it was a really good overview of of working those cases up and looking at your diagnostics, looking at your clinical case and, 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 and evaluating all that information to get to your final diagnosis. So that was really good. Um, he highlighted the immunodiagnostics, uh, you know, some key points that, you know, a negative serum is pretty indicative of no infection or, or maybe a per acute very recent infection, or maybe you did, if you're just looking at one pathogen, uh, say sarcocystis neurona and not neospora, then maybe you need to look at both. It could just be that you missed the pathogen. And then a, a positive uh, serum is, is not, as we all know, does not e equal neural invasion. And um, also, you know, that the magnitude of the titer does not indicate infection uh, with or without is not specific to neural invasion. In other words, a really high titer does not in indicate neural invasion. So focusing on the fact that we need to look at 
immunodiagnostics and look at which we all know is serum and CSF, looking at that antibody ratio and that a serum to CSF ratio of less than 64 is, is strongly supportive of an EPM diagnosis. Some of the new stuff on diagnosis diagnostics that he looked at, uh, a few years ago, Caitlin James, that was that worked there with NECLA for a while, she she published a paper um, showing that there was a that looking at toxoplasmosa gondii in horses uh, with a clinical presentation of EPM, showing that horses uh, were four times more likely to have high titers to toxoplasma gondii. Uh, EPM clinical cases were four times more likely to have toxoplasma gondii titers, which was interesting. And so that led him to to move to another study where he actually looked at, he had 210, I believe it was 210 bank serum samples and CSF samples from horses, from EPM suspect horses where they got the, the blood and CSF. And he, and he looked at those bank samples and 70% of those, uh, there was no evidence of neural invasion. So in other words, the CSF was negative or the CS, uh, serum to CSF ratio was was below 64. Uh, and then 20% of them uh, were indicative of, of EPM based on uh, the serum to CSF being less than or equal to 64. But the interesting and kind of the new uh, information was that 7% of these, uh, they were negative for for toxopl for a negative for Neospora and for sarcocystis, but positive for Toxoplasma gondii with a serum to CSF titer of less than 64, suggesting neural invasion of Toxoplasma gondii. So that was that was interesting information. And actually, then he looked in the 6% of those were mixed infections with were a, a Toxoplasma plus Neospora or sarcocysta. So essentially, 13% of those those samples had a Toxoplasma component to them. Uh, so that would just, it's not suggest, you know, it's, it, there's more work, I guess what he was saying, and, and I took away from that, that there was more work that needs to be done, but that we should maybe give consideration that toxoplasma could be a third protozoal organism uh, associated with EPM. And then he looked at diagnostics. Another, another new thing on diagnostics was he looked at uh, quantitative PCR from CSF. And that, that was quite interesting. And he started that conversation with a case presentation where this horse didn't look like a typical EPM. The horse was asymmetri uh, asymmetrical presentation with a right rear limb, ataxia weakness, but the horse was not, it was not progressive, it was, it was acute, and it was not multifocal. The serum was positive, but the CSF was negative. So looking at that information, you would think, okay, this is not a a positive clinical EPM case, but yet they ruled out everything else. And when they did the quantitative PCR on the CSF, it was positive, and they they can, uh, based on ruling everything else and those and that immunodiagnostics, they confirmed that horse positive. So he went back and looked, did did uh, quantitative PCR with the CSF of of the 210 bank samples you talked about previously, and and it was interesting that 12% uh, of those that under conventional diagnostics, the CSF was, there was no uh, EPM, there was no organism in the CSF or the serum to CSF titer was below or greater than 64, indicating that it would not conventional be a conventional diagnosis. He actually sh showed a positive quantitative PCR there. And it was also interesting that he, in horses that were looking back at the uh, presentation of those horses and the information they had on those cases that if the horse had been treated for EPM, they tended to have a negative quantitative PCR for CSF. So um, what's to be the take home message from there is just to maybe consider adding the quantitative PCR of CSF uh, if our immunodiagnostics in a case that looks to be cl highly clinically suspicious of EPM, maybe considering adding that to our diagnostic um, maybe adding that as another diagnostic modality to use to evaluate that case. And then at the end, he, he went through some preventative or prophylactic, metaphylactic treatment options uh, that might be considered in high-risk courses or in endemic areas. He, he expanded on three studies that have shown the benefit of using protozoal or diclazerol in reducing seroprevalence, as well as the magnitude of titers. 
in horses in high uh, high risk or high exposure areas. The first study was uh, serial prevalence in 33 foals on an endemic farm. Broke them into treatment and and uh, treatment and control groups. And in the treatment group, they received half the label dose, so half a milligram per kilogram of prodisol or diclosurel once a day, uh, starting at four weeks of age and carrying, uh, going through a year. And uh, the bottom line there, the, the conclusion was that in the untreated, uh, the serial prevalence was 53 to 88%. I believe it was 88% at the end of the study after 12 months. And in the treated group, uh, there was a steady decline from 29% to 6% of serial prevalence in that group. And then he went on to discuss briefly, and that study was actually published in Vet Journal 2015. Then he went on to talk about um, another study looking at half milligram per kilogram of diclazerol or protozil given every three to four days, um, showing that 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 maintained drug levels in both blood and CSF that were above the MIC of 100 nanograms per ml. And then after just a single dose, um, it's very well absorbed and you get a C max of, of three times the MIC or, or 300 nanograms per ml. Um, and that kind of led them to progress to the final study he presented on, which has not been published. And by that way, that, that pharmacokinetic study uh, looking at a half mig per kg every three to four days. That was published, I believe, in, in uh, the vet journal in 2018. So that paper is published as well. The final study he talked about has not been published. It's just been completed. And that was looking at taking 20 horses that were moved from uh, moved to an endemic farm. And these horses, when they came to the farm, their titers were low. Uh, and then... Uh, they segregated the horses into a treatment and non-treatment group and treated them every three to four days or twice a week at half milligram per kilogram or half the label dose of protozil and then measured uh, titers monthly and drug levels every 60 days in that group of horses and carried them through to a year. And uh, the results of that study showed a significant reduction in magnitude of titers uh, during that 12 month period of time and also it showed that the drug levels remained well above the MIC throughout the study when with the trough levels being checked every 60 days. So there's a lot of really good information in that study and hope I didn't go too long here Kim but it was just yeah, I would encourage everybody to 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 listen to that presentation and the, and everything that Nick Dr. Pasterla had there. And I think it's available still if you go to the uh, virtual trade show and you search on the Merck to go to the Merck booth and in and in that if you if you click uh, Dr. Snyder uh, let me know this that if you click on the resources tab I believe you can find that recording there uh, I don't know how long it's going to be there but if you if, if one of the listener if the listener goes there and they can't find that recording if it's been taken down then then let us know please reach out to us and we'll be happy to try to, to get that information for you yeah I love dr Perstola's uh, presentations I always learn a lot every time I listen to him so are there any final thoughts from anyone from any of our Merck guests today that uh, you would like to say about the convention the presentations? Wanting to get out of 2020 and into 2021. Kim, well, Kim, I might, uh, you know, you all have heard my voice enough here <laughs> today, but I just might extend a big thanks to you and to Equa Management for allowing Merck the opportunity to sponsor these podcasts this year in 2020. It's been phenomenal. I think the podcasts have been exceptional. You've done a great job. Uh, moderating and, and, and presenting the podcast to the listeners. And I also want to extend, extend a really huge thank you to the presenters and the people that you reached out to uh, that helped uh, present these podcasts so that us veterinarians driving down the road or at home or whatever could listen to this and, and obtain very valuable information. So a big thank you to all the presenters that contributed to the podcast this year. So uh, I want to thank 
extend that thanks to you, Equa Management, and all the presenters for 2020's podcast and looking forward to 2021. Well, also looking you. forward to maybe a live meeting in 2021 in Nashville. Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. Barnett, and thanks for everyone listening today. And I guess the cat's out of the bag for all of you to know that Merck will be the 2021 sponsor of Disease Du Jour. And we have got some really great topics planned for next year with a big focus on veterinarians in the field, um, trying to do some, some podcasts that will cover some topics that are more specific to you if you are out on the farm and trying to deal with a problem in person. And Merck is going to add four webinars to the podcast series next year. So as we, as you're listening to the podcast, we will tell you right up front, hey, there is a webinar that goes with this topic, and we will post those videos on equimanagement.com free and open for everyone to watch. So we really are excited to uh, be able to do those. And if you've missed any of the podcast episodes, you can go look for Disease Du Jour on your favorite podcast network, or you can go to equimanagement.com and there are podcasts on uh, and articles for each one of them uh, for all year for 2020. We want to thank you again for joining us today and a big thanks to Merck for believing in veterinarian education, vet student, vet techs, all those that are interested in listening to the podcast. And we invite you to visit equimanagement.com and take our survey so we know how to better serve you and if you have any questions or suggestions, you can send me an email at kbrown, that's the letter K, brown, at aimmedia.com. Disease Du Jour is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network. Thank you.